debunking the illusion that a narcissistic abuser knows you best. Do you or have you felt like someone who mistreats you knows you better than anyone else? Do you or have you worked extremely hard to become who that person would approve of? And do you or have you found it near impossible to turn away from this person? Well, I talk a lot about the importance of gaining distance from narcissistically abusive people because this can be essential to recovering a good quality of life for scapegoat survivors. But, or and, this is often easier said than done. It can feel extremely difficult to gain distance from someone whom you believe knows you best, no matter how poorly they treat you also. To move away from them can feel like you are moving away from yourself. This threatens the terrible state of being nobody to no one. In today's video, I address how a scapegoat child grows to see the parent who is depriving, devaluing, and controlling to know them best. I will explain how this helps the scapegoat child survive their childhood. Then I'll, I'll discuss how this coping strategy can make it hard to leave narcissistically abusive relationships today. Third, I will illustrate these ideas with an in-depth case example. And I hope you watch until the end because I'll then describe the healing process of embracing being known best by those who treat you well. Well, my name is Jay Reed and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in California, and I specialize in recovery from narcissistic abuse. In my professional and personal experience, I've worked to identify the fundamentals to the process of recovery. And this has led me to what I call the three pillars of recovery. Pillar number one is making sense of what happened so that you know it wasn't your fault. Pillar number two is moving away from narcissistic abusers and towards safe people. And pillar number three is living in defiance of the narcissist rules. I think it's also essential to find and participate in communities of people who can get, validate, and support you on this path. I've both seen and experienced large improvements in quality of life after applying these pillars. I'd also like to mention that I'm offering a new free ebook called Four Ways to Heal for Adult Scapegoat Survivors. And in it, I offer four strategies to reclaim your authentic self from the fake and painful scapegoat identity. Learn and apply the science behind gaining distance from narcissistic abusers today. Know the secret to reducing social anxiety for scapegoat survivors and a way to accept yourself as the fallible and valuable person you are. And you can find the link to the book in the description box below. What being known means to the scapegoat child. A narcissistic parent uses their scapegoat child to embody the worthlessness they cannot stand in themselves. There is a subtle but very powerful psychological process through which this happens. The parent first unconsciously notices and relocates their own feelings of worthlessness so that they seem to exist in the child. Next, they influence the child to adopt these feelings as the child's own. This is where deprivation, devaluation, and control comes in. The child who is on the receiving end of such treatment is more apt to conclude that they are worthless. Once the child has donned the costume of the parent's unwanted feelings of worthlessness, the parent feels less endangered by these feelings. From the scapegoat child's perspective, they know that when they feel bad about who they are, that they are somehow in sync with their parent. When the scapegoat child dislikes themselves, they get to share a reality with their parent. Importantly, this is the only reality their parent makes available to them. The parent is rigid in this way, while the scapegoat child has the psychological flexibility to adapt. If the scapegoat child concludes they are bad, then people who treat them badly must know them best. And this understandable reasoning also strengthens their tie to the narcissistic parent. We tend to feel closest to the people we believe understand us best. How this definition of being known helps a scapegoat child survive. First, having a parent who, again, supposedly cares. The scapegoat child has to find a way to be close to their parent as a matter of survival. A child comes into the world much too small and helpless to make it on their own. They need a caretaker whom they can believe is available and willing to care for them. 
The narcissistic parent's mistreatment of the child can make this very hard to believe for the child. Experiencing the parent to know them best restores their belief that the parent cares about them. Now the parent is not mistreating the child. They're just treating the child the way the child supposedly, again, deserves to be treated. Discounting positive feedback. The scapegoat child has to psychologically work to share in the narcissistic parent's reality. This is because of how distorted and artificial the parent's claims of the child's badness are. The child will likely find different receptions for who they are at school, with friends, and even other adults. In order to maintain allegiance to the reality with their parent, the child needs a way to resolve these discrepancies. By assuming that the person who treats them the worst knows them the best, the scapegoat child can discount others' positive feedback. After all, what is the value of positive feedback from someone whom you do not believe truly knows you? You're likely to privately say something like, if they only knew the real me, in order to kind of discount the validity of, of anything positive they may be offering. A sense of self. The other survival benefit is the scapegoat child creates a sense of identity where they may otherwise have none. Sure, it's a painful and artificially bad identity, but that beats having no identity. The self that is established can feel like it is most alive when close to the narcissistic parent, sometimes so close that the child can experience the parent to be a part of themselves. So what the parent wants or needs is also what the child wants and needs. The cost of this definition of being known to the scapegoat survivor. Seeing the narcissistic parent as knowing the scapegoat survivor best makes it difficult to move away from such people today. First, when the scapegoat child has had to see the parent as a part of themselves, they have a much harder time being independent from that parent. Since the tie to this parent feels like a part of the child, independence from the parent is like a separation from the child's self. The scapegoat survivor can stay close to a narcissistic abuser relatedly to keep their self in this way intact, a self whose jurisdiction painfully includes this type of person. It can also feel difficult to separate from a narcissistic abuser when their approval is all that matters. The scapegoat child in this situation was constantly met with disapproval from their parent. There's an implicit promise that if the child would only act think, and be different, then the parent would approve of them. The child is influenced to put all of their faith into this promise because the parent, again, supposedly knows them best. So if they can become who their disapproving parent finally approves of, then they will deserve the supposedly needed redemption, which they have been seeking. The scapegoat child and survivor may chase approval that is impossible to get in this way. The narcissistic parent has their own separate reasons to continue seeing the child as worthless. Doing so allows the parent to avoid these feelings in themselves. So no matter what the child does, the narcissistic parent will be motivated to discredit them. The game is rigged against the child and they cannot question the rules. Well, and let's look at an, another anonymized case example to illustrate. Sarah could not remember a time when her mother said a sincere, kind word to her. As a child, she felt like her mother's enemy, despite wanting to be seen as an ally. Whenever Sarah came into a room, she'd brace herself for her mother's criticism. Perhaps her hair was going to be told it was out of place, or her outfit didn't match, or her shoes were scuffed. Or her mother might just attack Sarah's character. Sarah was called thoughtless, selfish, immature, and inconsiderate in heavy rotation throughout her upbringing. Worse was that Sarah had no other adult in her life to counter these messages. Her father excused himself from her mother's tirades against, against Sarah. He'd act as if nothing was wrong and never inquired as to how Sarah might be feeling. As cruel as her mother was, she was also the closest person to her. In the absence of any other adult's feedback, Sarah concluded that her mother knew her best. As Sarah moved from childhood to early adolescence, she lived based on what she thought would please her mother. This caused her to live in a state of near constant anxiety. 
always scanning for what task or action she should take to avoid her mother's wrath. She would try to do her chores before being asked. She would be sure to get her homework done. But no matter what Sarah did, she could not prevent her mother from finding fault with her. From afar, it would be plain to see that her mother was setting Sarah up to have an excuse to yell at her and attack her. She'd asked Sarah if she had done something she had asked like a week ago and had never followed up on. If Sarah hesitated for even a moment, her mother would explode with accusations that Sarah doesn't care about her, does not respect the family, and is too immature to be trusted and or is irresponsible. All of these accusations hit Sarah at her, her core because she was hearing them from the person who, again, supposedly knew her best. As poorly as Sarah was treated at home, she found herself spending more and more time there. Sarah was confused with how she was treated at school. Her classmates seemed to like her. They'd often laugh at her jokes and tell her that she was funny. Sarah thought, they only like me because they want to be entertained. They don't care how I really am, like my mom does. These kinds of thoughts let Sarah discount the value of her classmates' positive reception of her. It also made her want to stay closer to her home so she could pursue the goal of winning her mother's approval. Sarah believed her mother's approval was the only one that mattered. Unfortunately for Sarah, her mother needed Sarah to feel worthless in order for her mother to keep her own self-worth intact. She never granted Sarah the approval that Sarah so desperately sought because that conflicted with how she needed to use Sarah. Sarah did have one best friend named Jill who would see how Sarah was getting emotionally abused by her mother. Jill was an empathic young woman who was very distressed by what she saw. She consulted with her parents and asked what she should do. Together, they determined that Jill should maybe gently tell Sarah that she didn't deserve this kind of treatment. So one day when they were walking home from high school, Jill said, hey, what was going on with your mother yesterday? Jill had witnessed her mother yelling at Sarah the day before. Sarah said, well, what do you mean? Jill said, does she always yell at you like that? Sarah said, oh, only when I've done something wrong. And Jill said, well, I don't think it's right. I talked with my parents and they thought it was wrong too. We all think you're a, a good person and deserve to be treated better. Sarah felt extremely anxious. She wanted to believe what Jill was saying but something inside would not let her. She felt like a part of her would die if she took a stand against her mother. She was so confused. She played it off by saying, yeah, I appreciate that and I'll think about it. So what did you think about the math test today? Redefining what it means to be known. Well, it's a process like so many of these things, I think in, in the recovery journey of, from narcissistic abuse, um, to let go of the conviction that a narcissistic parent or partner knows you best. And this is because believing this saved the scapegoat survivor from feeling like nobody to no one. So surrendering this belief can threaten that same trauma. A scapegoat survivor needs to gradually come to believe that they will stay known by others if they surrender this belief. The catch is that the scapegoat survivor will be and feel known in a different way. Instead of being known as someone who deserves to be deprived, devalued, and controlled, they get to be known as someone who deserves to be nourished, valued, and free. Initially, these positive ways of being known will likely feel less real than the older, harsh ways. The image for me, at least, that comes to mind is, is picturing the scapegoat child initially at like a fork in the road. And on the left leads to a world or the path on the left leads to a world where they are perfectly acceptable as they are. And they seek the company of those who treat them as such. If they encounter people who treat them poorly, they move away from them and towards those who treat them well. On the right is the road that they are forced to take. Here, their narcissistic parents' devaluing view of them has to be agreed with. Now the child is not fundamentally acceptable, but needs to change who they are to please the parent. Well, I think of the process of healing, going back to the fork, might be thought of as the scapegoat survivor 
really realizing how far down the road on the right they have had to travel. And now they must leave this road and still the forks here, right? And travel the unmarked territory to get back to this road on the left. Moving towards this other road will likely be unfamiliar, disorienting at times, and scary. I mean, after all, you think of the fork, in between these two roads is a lot of unmapped territory, which is sort of, I think, a good metaphor for what has to be kind of negotiated in the scapegoat survivor's um, journey back to that left uh, path, a path where they are just fine as is, and the there's a new sort of problem and solution. The problem being, who am I surrounding myself with? Are people uh, reflecting back that I'm acceptable as is? If so, great, stay there. And if not, go elsewhere. Um, but at core, at the person's core, there's nothing that needs to be fundamentally changed. Despite the unfamiliarity and disorientation and fear that can ex that, that a scapegoat survivor can experience as they move from that right path to the left, I think there's tends to be this drive to find a, a way of living that feels truly congruent with who the scapegoat survivor is. And that often that drive leads one to persist. And the persistence may feel like, well, what other choice is there? But nonetheless, I think that's a, a, a very strong source of determination that so many scapegoat survivors possess. And finally, this crossing from the road on the right to the road on the left cannot be done alone. I think here is where therapy can be particularly helpful because you have someone who understands why it was necessary to take the road on the right in the first place, someone who doesn't reinforce the conditions of relationship that the narcissistic parent imposed. In other words, you're with someone who is safe. Three, they can empathize with and help you navigate holes to go back to the road on the right. And four, this person, the therapist, can let you know that you are still known even when you are not abiding by the rules of the road on the right. I can't overstate how radical of a change this can be for the scapegoat survivor. Such levels of change in a person's psychology have to happen gradually. So the more patience, compassion, and nourishment you can offer yourself through this, the better. And by nourishment, in this case, I mean even if it feels like you're losing progress towards this goal or any other on a particular day, you might still do something kind to yourself. Such acts can pay real dividends, not just in the immediate, but throughout the process of migrating you know, from the road on the right writ large to the road on the left. Well, if you sort of identify as a scapegoat survivor and, has sort of, and have kind of found this invisible glue that is sort of psychological glue that has stuck you to kind of um, people who treat you in, in um, devaluing, depriving, or controlling ways, I hope today's video uh, might be of some use in kind of understanding some of that and maybe orienting yourself to the process of surrendering uh, the notion that someone like this uh, knows you best. Um, again, it being a process uh, and not uh, uh, doesn't happen in, of course, one fell swoop. Well, and with that, I want to thank you for your continued uh, engagement, participation with and um, support of you know the, this YouTube channel, uh, you know the eBooks and courses and books surrounding it. Um, yeah, I feel like a broken record uh, each week, uh, and you know very much mean it. But um, thank you uh, from Brizo back there and myself. We look forward to posting again um, next Friday. Take care.